tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai, haere mai, welcome to the first seminar for the Early Childhood Seminar Series in 2023. We'll begin our time together with a karakia. Me e noi tātou. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ponamu te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa. Homie, huie, tai kie. We know that many of you who are based in New Zealand will have spent today responding to the challenges that have arisen and continue to arise as a result of the severe weather we've been experiencing. This is a tough time for our early childhood services and communities. Kia kaha, kia maya, kia manawa nui, mihi aroha nui, kia koutou katoa. Thank you for making the time to join us today for a presentation by Professor Elizabeth Wood from the University of Sheffield in England. Professor Wood's presentation with its focus on play is timely in reminding us of the value of play and the opportunities it provides for collective and relational agency in our lives. The recording of this presentation will be available on our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel after the seminar. Please do use the chat function to connect with each other and the panelists throughout this presentation. And if you have any questions for Professor Wood, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask them and she will respond to them at the end of her presentation. I will now pass over to Professor Helen Hedges to welcome and introduce Professor Wood. Kia ora, Helen. Tēnā koe, Justine. Kia ora koutou. Page 15 of Te Whāriki notes that a curriculum whāriki for young children provides a rich array of primarily play-based experiences. By engaging in these, children learn to make sense of their immediate and wider worlds through exploration, communication and representation. Young children are developing an interest in literacy, mathematics and other domain knowledge. They can exhibit highly imaginative thinking. Within this quote, the value of play in multiple ways is clear. The word primarily indicates that play should be a leading experience. However, it also opens the door for other forms of experiences and pedagogies. That door has perhaps been wedged wide open in the English early years curricular document over the past 30 years. So despite the most recent version saying children will mostly be taught through games and play, downwards pressure from schooling has edged its way insidiously into policy, knowledge and practice. And as our presenter will argue today, discourses of performance and outcomes. Therefore, I'm delighted and privileged to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Elizabeth Wood. Elizabeth began her education career as a teacher in primary schools at a time when play was deemed important, but beginning to be questioned. Elizabeth became a teacher researcher on a project. And as they say, the rest is history with now a prolific career as a researcher, writer and advocate for play in the early years, among other things. Our presentation today will be a salutary reminder of what we work to hold dear in enacting Te Whāraki in New Zealand and signals to be alert for in policy discourse. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Helen. And um, hello to everybody. And I do hope that you are all able to be taking care of yourselves and your loved ones and friends and family at this very difficult time. Um, it is, in spite of the weather, an enormous pleasure and privilege to be here in this beautiful country in New, in New Zealand. And I've been spending time with my family and with friends. I just haven't seen very much of your beautiful sunshine. However, I'm going to treat the weather like a naughty child and not give it too much attention. So as Helen says, my focus today is on play for its own sake. And you would think after so many years of excellent research on play in so many countries that we would um, be able to take this for granted as a concept, as a working concept in our work and in our practice with young children. But what I'm saying to you today comes partly from my English perspective 
and the policy context within England, but it comes partly with a kind of warning. Helen and I are writing at the moment about the, um, the potential, but also some of the dangers of uncritical policy borrowing. Um, so this comes with a little bit of a warning, not to be borrowing too many policies from the early years foundation stage in England, um, because I and many of my colleagues I work with at the University of Sheffield in the School of Education believe that the early years foundation stage is heading in the wrong direction, where the wrong direction is away from freely chosen play for its own sake. So these are the organising concepts for today's presentation. I'm going to talk about play in policy and practice. And again, taking the perspective from England, we have a very strong discourse now on what is known as educational play, where this focuses mostly on the adaptation to the status quo. In other words, play must be used for specific purposes and it must help teachers to be able to demonstrate that children are meeting the outcomes in the early years foundation stage. I'm going to contrast this with a justification of why play for its own sake is important from children's perspectives. I'm going to draw on Helen's work and work that Helen is doing with colleagues at Sheffield on children's sources and funds of knowledge in play. And I use funds of knowledge also to include the play knowledge that children need in order to be able to be a good player, to participate successfully in what I understand to be a highly complex social practice. I'm going to share with you some ideas about the importance of multimodality and uh, recent research on converged digital and traditional play. And underpinning most of what I say today is going to be uh, an understanding of children's agency. And again, I'm using this concept as a way of disrupting and speaking back to the early years foundation stage, which understands children's learning as highly individualized whereas contemporary social sociocultural theories encourage us to focus on the collective and what the individual within the collective and the collective within the individual can produce. And I'm talking, um, I'm also going to think about the breadth and the sheer creativity of children's play repertoires, that is what they play with, and what they play at, and the ways in which those, those play repertoires have past, present, and future orientations. So I'm just going to start by connecting you with some of the language of the early years foundation stage, and to consider how that affects practitioners in England. I think it's also interesting for you to see the nature of the discourse here. Um, the fact that the UIFS recall requires all areas of learning to be delivered, as if learning comes in a supermarket van. The idea of planned and purposeful play has also been appropriated in the um, English foundation stage as really privileging adults' plans and adults' purposes. So although the framework tells us that there should be a balance of adult-led and child-initiated child -initiated activities, that balance is really called into question by other aspects of policy in the Early Years Foundation stage, not least because policy tells us that in the final year, when children are only between the ages of four and five, that balance must change towards more directed adult-led activities, more formal learning activities, in order to prepare children 
for year one of key stage one. So children move into compulsory education in England around about age five. Again, the foundation stage tells us that to make the most of the learning possibilities offered by play, they, they need a balance between activities which children can initiate, initiate and which can be guided by adults. Now, again, we come back to this idea of balance and what I'm starting to read in research and also what I and my colleagues are observing in practice is that there are more activities now that are guided by adults. And I have for many years warned about the dangers of adults taking over children's play and trying to get play to produce outcomes that are much more in tune with what the adults want to see and less in tune with what children are producing in their freely chosen and self-initiated play. I am not arguing for an uncritical return to freely chosen play as the main mode of activity. And this is because we have a huge amount of research that gives us very productive and creative ways in which children and adults engage in activities in very playful ways. However, I am warning against adults setting learning outcomes, then creating an activity that they consider to be play, but is probably very far from children's understanding of play. So in other words, um, I am concerned about the discourse of capturing play towards defined outcomes if and when it changes the balance away from children's self-initiated and freely chosen play. So again, the Department for Education tells us that practitioners should adopt a fluid, flexible approach, but the earliest foundation stage is organized around hierarchical and normative developmental indicators. It is not the kind of open weaving that you have in Tafariki. So the level of development often determines the kind of choices and actions that practitioners are making, both in their adult directed activities and in their provision for play. So play is also positioned as the route through which the areas of learning should be delivered. And again, here you can see that we've got tensions in this discourse between balanced, fluid, flexible approaches and the idea of play being a delivery mechanism. We do have three characteristics of effective teaching and learning, but I think that these characteristics are mainly about producing the self-regulated child. So playing and exploring for me have much more open-ended and creative possibilities. And this is um, very much substantiated by the research, but it's reduced to children investigate and experience things and have a go. So for me, this is a fairly reductive understanding or definition of what playing and exploring are about. You can also see that in active learning and creative creating and thinking critically, that there is this emphasis on who the child must become, the behaviorally self-regulated child. I'm not arguing against those things. What I am arguing against is narrow constructs of really important concepts such as playing and exploring and creativity. So these are some of the ideas that I'm currently drawing on in my work with Helen and also in my work with colleagues in the University of Sheffield with Liz Chesworth in particular, um, but also with um, uh, Louise Kay and Christina Fashanu. So Anna Stetsenko's work draws attention to the important concept of agency and I'm going to give her definition shortly. 
I come back to the work of Lois Holtzman, who's always influenced my thinking um, a lot, that play is not just about the delivery of outcomes. Play enables us to see the universe, the unity of being and becoming, and especially the unity of affect and cognition. And I do feel very concerned that in the um, prescribed outcomes in the early years foundation stage, there is much more about behavior and um, self-regulation than there is about affect and cognitive development. I have always been inspired by the work of Jackie Marsh on um, literacies and popular culture. And I want to link those ideas to Helen and Liz's work on children's interests and funds of knowledge. I'm going to share with you some work from Christina from her PhD about the importance of multimodal and multilingual communicative practices and the way in which play for its own sake enables children to engage in really important knowledge exchange that helps to create their unique and collective identities. Um, it's also worth noting that none of the research that I draw on has informed the early years foundation stage. So let's first of all um, turn to this interesting idea about children's agency. Agency is sometimes interpreted as individual will or individual action, will that drives action. However, Anna Stetsenko reminds us that about the importance of context, of situativity, and embodiment. That is that agent, agency is embodied, not just in one's own individual body, but in the body of action and the body of activity that is happening collectively. Stetsenko talks about historicity, which is what children bring into their um, play and into their activities from their homes, uh, their family beliefs and cultures and um, activities within their local communities. She talks about the notion of learning being distributed between and among learners. And that doesn't just mean children, that means the humans in the setting, the materials in the setting, and everything that children are drawing on in their interactions. She talks about participatory learning theories, and I'm sure you will be very um, familiar with those because they underpin so many of the values within um, Tifariki. And the notion of learning as cultural mediation, and I'm going to give some examples of each of those things from um, some of the research projects and some of my students' PhD work as well. So I chose this picture um, as, as a little bit of history in the sense that it takes us back to, not only to the pandemic, because lots of families were coming together in the local woods near my home and they were building dens and cubbies. But I spent some time recently in Melbourne and um, with Deb Moore, and some of you may know her work on children's secret spaces. And when we compared photographs that we'd taken during the pandemic, we could see that the cubbies that had been built outside were almost exactly the same. So we had an interesting conversation about not just cultural differences, but cultural cons constants across um, different communities um, in diff very different parts of the world. So I've talked about um, the importance of play as complex social practices. I use this as a way of contesting the very narrowly framed delivery model of play and the delivery of mod model of learning that we have in the, um, in the early years foundation stage. In order to understand play as complex social practices, we also need to understand knowledge in use in communities of players. Now, um, I will agree with uh, much of the work that um, has been available for a long time. 
on children's emergent literacy, um, children becoming scientists, becoming geographers, becoming real world writers, thinkers, readers. But knowledge and use in community of players also relates directly to what it means to be a player. Children need complex social knowledge about how to join play, how to fit in with play, how you pitch in to an activity where you may be really not quite sure yet what the rules are. Who knows what the rules are and who lets you into play? Who lets you come into the play? Who lets you stay in the play? And importantly, how do you become a skilled player, a competent player? Because there are things that happen within play that can only be learned by being a player and participating or pitching in to play as complex social practices. And this for me is one very strong argument for play for its own sake, for the simple reason that we as adults cannot, and in fact should not be trying to teach children those skills. It may be sometimes that children are excluded and can be very hurt by being excluded. And that's a different role for the adult in helping children to get along together and to share their play experiences. But by and large, research shows that children are pretty good at sorting out the rules, communicating the rules, and even enabling new rules, new ideas, and new suggestions to come into the play in ways that enrich and extend the play. So we can understand play as a complex social practice, but also this emphasis this emphasizes play as being non-linear. Now this for me is again an antithesis to the linear and normative goals within the early years foundation stage, because we can think about play as instantiating possibilities. We can think of learning as webs and as complex assemblages. There is an awful lot that children learn when they are engaged in play for its own sake, that they cannot and probably would not learn outside of those contexts. We know from Helen's work that about the importance of children's funds of knowledge, their interests and their passions. And these also contribute to Anna Stetsenko's understanding of transformative agency. It is within play that children build their own identities, that contribute to the building of a collective identity and collective change in thinking, understanding and being. We also know um, that literacies and popular culture are sources of shared funds of knowledge. And I'm coming back to this idea of popular culture in the context of contemporary understandings of converge play. Now, understanding play as a complex social practice does not rule out the importance of the, what we might call the subject areas or the areas of learning that children engage with in um, their early childhood settings. Subject or areas from a sociocultural perspective are important cultural tools. And certainly when I was a teacher, I was always um, in, impressed and amazed by the way that children brought literacy related cultural tools into their play um, to enrich and extend the play. So I don't rule out the importance of subject knowledge because subject knowledge is what helps to um, inform funds of knowledge and to drive children's inquiries in, um, in their play. So just coming back to this idea of funds of knowledge in relation to literacies and popular culture, I've used this image from Jackie Marsh's work quite a lot. First of all, because it's, um, it's a, a schema, it's a representation of this idea of sources and funds of knowledge not being linear, but existing as interconnected 
webs of meaning and also webs of activity. You can see from this that Jackie is justifying and explaining the importance of popular cultural texts and artifacts in young children's lives. But we can see that each of these brings important sources of knowledge and that the knowledge about popular culture is often used amongst children as cultural exchange. So for example, to become a skilled player, you might in contemporary contexts need to know an awful lot about a Disney film such as Frozen. You might need to learn, know a lot about a television programme, for example, um, Bob the Builder. So children bring these knowledges into their play because they have important cultural meanings and they form the basis for knowledge exchange, conceptual exchange, and for building knowledge in amongst communities of players. There has been a tendency in early childhood education sometimes to undervalue popular culture, but actually it really is important stuff for children to engage with in their play and can be very enriching of their play as well. So I'm going to relate the idea of uh, multiliteracies and multimodality to this, um, again, another relatively new idea of converged play, where digital and traditional play come together. And again, we can see that there are um, quite justified ongoing debates about children's engagement with um, digital technologies the amount of time they are spending on digital technologies and the kinds of things they are doing and whether those things are um, good or bad for their mental and physical health. So those are all important debates that we need to engage in. However, a more uh, positive understanding of converged play indicates that convergence between digital and di traditional play Digital is not replacing traditional play. Rather, converged play sustains the qualities of play and playfulness that are so important to how children engage in play for its own sake. So they maintain the qualities of creativity, open-endedness, flexibility, and choice, which are important characteristics of open-ended play. We can see from the research that in children's converged play, they are making decisions, creating and solving problems. They might be taking some risks and de developing metacognitive um, capabilities, that is talking and thinking about their play, redrafting, redirecting, reformulating their own goals. We also know from research that children move between global influences and local interpretations. So they might be drawing on, for example, a Disney film, but they might be recontextualizing those stories using their own local and um, cultural knowledges as well. So multimodal practices, multimodal communica communicative practices with digital and traditional play are rich with symbols, tools, and meanings. And part of the expertise of being a player and part of the complexity of play as a social practice is that children move seamlessly across modes. So I'm giving those, um, some of those ideas to you to think about. I was recently in uh, two kindergartens in Australia and coincidentally both of them said we have no digital technologies in our settings because we believe that children get quite enough of that in their home lives and that is a, a justification for, um, for their practice but it's worth thinking about some of the positives and some of the benefits of converged play. Again to link it to the idea of play for its own sake. Okay, so I want to just share um, two research projects with you now. 
Both of them were conducted in Sheffield, which is the city where I live. This is a project that Liz and I have been doing, funded by the Frobel Trust. And we were, un we were interested in understanding pr practitioners' curriculum decision-making. The setting was in a very diverse area and there were around 26 languages, 25 languages were spoken in this particular setting. We set about observation and documentation of play. We carried out conversations where possible with children, and we engaged in reflective dialogues with practitioners and parents. Now, something that we have been interested in for a long time is this idea that one important role for practitioners is to organize the environment, both indoors and outdoors, to make provision of materials, resources for, to support children's play, to think about where they are located, even whether children can combine resources. So for example, whether they can take small world play into the sand area or into the water tray. So we were interested in how practitioners are making decisions about curriculum. Because we were focused on an early years setting, we also wanted to explore the idea of how curriculum arises from children's interests and funds of knowledge, and the extent to which practitioners use observation to identify children's interests and funds of knowledge. And here we were picking up an idea from Helen's work that sometimes interests can be interpreted at a surface level. In other words, practitioners may not go deeper into the activity to understand what is happening when children choose water play or sand play, or even when they go to the book area. So those are some of the ideas we were working with in this particular project. So our broad findings were, um, perhaps they're not going to surprise you, that children's interests developed from their participation in multi-generational family practices. There were a lot of, there was a lot of bread making activity in this setting, caring for siblings, hobbies, family-based hobbies and interests such as dinosaurs, other things related to favorite family television programs, and of course, religious practices. There was much evidence of engagement between children and children in their families with popular culture and lots of talk about television, film and digital media. And certainly with one child, his deep interest in dinosaurs reflected conversations at home, reading books, um, looking at films and documentaries about, about dinosaurs with his family members. And this child was only four years old. So you could see very visibly his sources and funds of knowledge. So this is Sasuna. And Liz and I have used this, um, the example of Sasuna as a way of provoking thinking about interests being interpreted either at a surface level or at a deep level. Um, the practitioners and when we were in the setting, we noticed that Sasuna always chose the water play. She chose to wash the doll. She also chose to put extra bubbles into the water tray and as you can see here, to make lots and lots of bubbles before she started washing the doll. Now, the activity at a surface level is water play, washing the doll in the water tray and um, enjoying making the bubbles. So that was interpreted as um, a very sensory activity for Sasuna, and she enjoyed washing the baby with her friends as well. When we spoke to Sasuna's mother, um, we learned that she has a, a baby sister, and Sasuna wants to be involved in the care of the baby sister, and especially at washing time when the baby is being bathed at home. But Sasuna's mum said, it's okay, you can just wash the foot 
because I don't think that giving responsibility for washing a whole baby to a three-year-old is probably the right decision. So here you can see Sasuna is washing the doll's foot because she is mirroring um, the practices that she has been learning at home. How to be a sister, how to care for a baby, how to care for your baby sister. So play becomes the context, water play becomes the context in which Sasuna is demonstrating her deep interests, her emotional engagement with being a sister and sharing these activities with, um, with her friends in the nursery. So we use this as an example of going beyond the surface, especially of children's freely chosen play to understand their decisions, their actions, and what has meaning for children in the context of play. And I come back to um, my argument at the beginning that these are the kinds of activities that we can provide but we cannot, um, we need to be open to the possibilities of all kinds of things coming into the space of the water tray, the building area, the outdoor area. So as soon as home-based practices were really important for driving her interests that were evident in her water play. Some research that Michelle Hill did some years ago also looked at the interests of older children. These children were between about uh, just under five years old to just under seven years old. So they were very articulate in um, being able to reveal their interests. And I think one thing that Michelle's work reminds us of, that play really does not stop when you are five years old and we still have to get to grips with a, a better understanding of progression. So these were some of the themes of children's interests and children's sources of knowledge that Michelle identified in her play, um, in the children's play. And she actually documented around 10 weeks worth of play that was focused almost on the, entirely on the themes of death, rebirth, death and dying. Hence why Michelle's thesis was called dead forever because the children were engaged in play that they called dead forever. Now not everybody would agree with allowing children to play with concepts that might be considered to be taboo or even very difficult for children to understand but Michelle had the courage to allow the children to develop their dead forever play over the course of um, 10 weeks because it provided such rich opportunities for knowledge exchange, for children to develop the play over time, and as well as their everyday experiences of death, rebirth, death and dying. There was also an interesting mix of zombies, skeletons, and various other characters from popular culture. So it was a very rich mix of children's knowledge, sons of knowledge, children's interests and a good example of why play for its own sake had importance for those children at that particular time. So I'm now just going to move on to <clears throat> Christina Tatham's research. Christina was one of my doctoral students and is now a colleague at the University of Sheffield and um, in her research, she has written a lot about children sharing multimodal, cultural and linguistic repertoires, again, in their freely chosen play. Now, Christina was looking at children age four to five in the reception class. So those children were at the, at the stage where fewer opportunities for play were being provided and more opportunities for teacher-led and um, adult-directed activities as a way to ensure that children were made ready for school. However, in these spaces, in these increasingly short spaces for children, Christina found that freely chosen play was a really important space for sharing multimodal, cultural and linguistic repertoires. 
Christina's methods were also particularly interesting because as you can see here, she used cartoons to um, document what the children were doing in their play. We had long discussions about video, about photographs, about whether she should use uh, preformed um, images of the children. But actually, it was the children who said, no, we will draw ourselves. You can use our pictures in your research. So this was a, a really interesting example of children genuinely participating in the research and helping Christina to understand what it is they were doing and saying and thinking and what they were playing with. So this is an example of children's multimodal and linguistic cultural repertoires. There was a lot of exchange between the children where they were using words randomly from their home languages or phrases from their home languages. But then there was a lot of negotiation in terms of expressing meaning, telling other children, what does this mean? And importantly, what does this mean in this context of our play? So you can see that there is somebody saying, oh, it means, it means naughty. No, it means dirty. Oh yes, it means a naughty girl. So here we have children learning to participate in multicultural and very diverse contexts in their own ways and on their own terms. So play for its own sake was providing these children with a space that was almost under the radar of everyday classroom practice. And I think it's important to remember that in England, although the Early Years Foundation stage says that children's home languages must be valued, the dominant language of the classroom is English. Children are expected to learn a good standard of English and all of the assessment practices are carried out in English. But here we see children being multilingual, multimodal and deeply engaged and interested in each other's linguistic repertoires. So, what does all this mean? What are the implications? Um, I think it's important that we come back to this idea of balance. Um, and we are very, very careful about words such as predominantly or mainly. We know from research that relationships, experiences, places, and materials have personal and collective meaning for children. And those meanings are very often expressed in their freely chosen play. Play knowledge connects cultural discourses and knowledges of home, early childhood um, education settings and communities. The knowledge that comes into the setting is rich with meaning, rich with understanding and needs to be valued as part of the community of practice. Children are very adept at sharing meanings and purposes, and those are evident when they have these spaces to engage in play for its own sake, as well as engaging with adults and other people who come into the setting. Their narratives indicate their engagement with global and local cultures. Um, and agreeing again with Anna Stetsenko's work, Agency is distributed across social, cultural, material, and relational contexts. So play is not just a context for self-actualization, but a context for being and becoming members of um, communities. So we can see that children are actively involved in creating their own environments, and those environments create uh, opportunities for exchanging this rich diversity of heritages, languages, cultural practices, all of which are connected to children's interests and fund, funds of knowledge. The significance of peer cultures is important in freely chosen play and play for its own sake, for social affiliation and cooperation, for building identities and relationships, the sharing multimodal cultural and linguistic repertoires, the sharing interests and funds of knowledge, and for understanding learning as being situated in many different contexts. But of course, we must also um, maintain a concern as practitioners 
with inclusion and, in, and equity. So I'm going to end on um, Anna Stetsenko's quotation, but also these two pictures remind me that as practitioners, as researchers, as teachers, um, as parents, as, met, as family members, I think we have, we have to remember the importance, certainly in England, of being a bit of a rebel and finding spaces for our own understandings um, so that the earliest foundation stage is perhaps interpreted in ways that might be more typical within New Zealand as open-ended possibilities, as a weaving of a mat and not just driving children through a linear progression. So for Stetsenko, the world is imbued with human dimensions, including struggle, rupture, disputability, contestation, commitment, and imagination. I think those are all qualities that we can see in play for its own sake, but I think those are the qualities that we as early childhood educators need to sustain play for its own sake. Thank you, Helen. I think you need to come back in to the space now. Kia ora. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, so much. It's always such a huge privilege to listen to you because you have, um, without doubt, uh, the most comprehensive scholarly understanding of play and the research on play um, that I know of. I often um, talk to colleagues and students about the comment that it's not possible to to have read all the research these days um, and I've always remind them of what you told me about how important it is to do the archaeological mm. dig and to really understand the literature um, and it's been a delight today to hear so many of these contemporary perspectives and ideas that you have shared with us. So we have um, a, a couple of questions that have come up and one of them relates to something you said early on, that, that this wonderful research that you have talked about, you said none of it has influenced the early years foundation stage. So we have a question from Alison Warren, who's asking, who are the gatekeepers that decide who and what informs the early years foundation stage, especially when there is a complexity of research within the UK, such as that you've um, talk, just talked about? Oh, that's a really good and a very political question. So thank you, Alison. Um, the gate, there are different gatekeepers and, uh, in every country. And um, our equivalent of your ERO is Ofsted, the Office for Standards in Education. Um, so one important gatekeeper is Ofsted. And believe it or not, not only are they an inspection agency, but they also produce what they called, call practice guidance documents. And they actually produced a practice guidance, doc guidance document called Teaching and Play. And um, as you do, I went to the, uh, the very last page to look at their sources of evidence for the claims that they were making. And I have to say, that if they'd submitted that document as an undergraduate essay, I would have sent it back and told them to, um, to look at more sources, to look at more reliable sources, and um, to critically evaluate the evidence before making some of the claims. So we have Ofsted acting as, in their own words, the sole arbiter of quality in early childhood education. And I have written about this because I find it so disturbing. The other gatekeepers are the politicians, the secretaries of state for education, and the particular view of education that they are promoting through their own political ideology. We also have a global discourse saying um, that early childhood education must produce what we might understand as the good citizen, but it also can be interpreted as the, the tame citizen. So we have Ofsted, we have our own politicians, we have global discourses about early childhood education. We also have professional voices from within the field. Now those professional voices are listened to when they have done large scale research, 
with sometimes with randomized control trials and with a strong driver about effectiveness and what works. As somebody from the Department for Education once said to me, don't come to me with your research unless you've got a sample size of at least 3,000 children. Hmm. So that's my answer to your question. <laughs> So what would be your advice to, to the many, many people who are here today, Liz, um, about how they might influence policy makers? Um, uh, practice focused research, uh, writing briefings for politicians. Um, the briefings I've been asked for is usually no longer than seven bullet points or one side of A4 bit difficult when you've just spent three years doing a large research project. Um, if we can't influence those gatekeepers, then I think that we should aim to influence our colleagues. And I'm doing that again with Liz and Louise, where we've started doing some research in one school, which is part of an academy trust. And now all the schools want us to, or the primary schools in the trust, want us to work with them on a similar project. So you can do it in a kind of spider's web in a networked way um, and not be afraid to own and justify your own practice when it comes to um, the dreaded inspection process. Well, thank you, that's, that's very good advice. Now Liz, we're getting quite a few questions around uh, play and engagement in play. You, you said that your talk today is not an uncritical call for a return to free play, but about engagement in playful ways. So we have a, a mix of simple to complex questions coming through about that. Um, firstly, Karen just wants to know what's the teacher-child ratio in the UK? And I guess you might want to refer to both the early years services and the reception year and yeah. answer um, the ratios are very different. If you are in a, um, a private sector um, uh, or other type of childcare setting, the ratio I think at the moment is around about one to eight, but it's lower for children birth to three. Most of our children age four to five will be in a reception class in a primary school. And that is, as I said, the school readiness year. The uh, ratio there is actually one to 15, which is problematic when you're talking about the kind of practices that I've been, um, that I consider to be important or we would consider to be important for young children. Mm, absolutely. Okay, so then there are a number of questions around um, what then it might mean to position adults who participate in interactions with children so um, Alex Gunn's asking beyond provision and, uh, of the environment, what is the place for the teacher? So she's suggesting things like, is it a provo provo provocateur? Thanks for that word, Alex. Um, is yeah. it about equity or inclusion or, or what else is it? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I think this perhaps brings us to the, the important point about the complexity of our roles in early childhood settings. Um, our work has often be re been reduced to analogous with mothering. It's female, it's work that women do. It's about caring. And those discourses I wouldn't discount, but they can serve to obscure the fact that the work that we do with children from birth to five is every bit as complex as getting children through their exams at 16 or 18. So articulating the complexity of those roles is important because we are constantly making um, moment by moment decisions according to what we're seeing in the setting. So some of what we do, I think is pre-decided. I talked before mm -hmm. about setting up the environment, the rules mm -hmm. of the setting, all of those important um, areas we attend to. Other decisions are literally on the hoof and it depends upon your role, what you actually choose to do, depends upon what you've observed, your deep knowledge of 
children as learners, children as human mm. beings, your equity goals, your concerns about inclusion, about equity, about anti-discriminatory practice. Mm. So interventions may take a different form according to how you have read in your professional knowledge what is actually happening with a child, um, a dyad or a group of children in a setting. And I think we also mm. need to get better at articulating um, the complexity of, of what we do. Yes, and the professional knowledge that underpins yes. it, what you've just been talking about. Yeah. Okay, so there's another, in a similar vein, Talitha is asking if you ever think that child-led play can go too far. Is there a point to intervene? And I guess um, Michelle Hill's work on death and dying might be an interesting example to talk about. Um, I think, I know when Michelle's done presentations about her work, some people have been genuinely shocked that A, she allowed the play theme to develop and B, some of the kind of ideas that the children were playing with. But she had a strong justification for um, enabling that play to happen but also making sure that she liaised with uh, parents and family members, making sure that um, the children's questions and inquiries were answered as honestly as possible, yeah. and that she was, she was bringing knowledge, she was responding to the knowledge that the children were bringing into the setting. Mm. So that was a particular teacher in a particular context and as I said, the children were older than the children where I would be seeing in um, a foundation stage setting at home. But this also comes back to our understanding, I think, of children's rights, seeing, yeah. understanding children's capabilities and treating children with respect. I come back to Bruner's um, adage, that we can teach anything to children mm. as long as we do it in an intellectually honest manner. But that also has to be situated within a wider framework of social and cultural values and beliefs. Mm. So again, I come back to professional decision-making and the knowledge is in, in use within communities of practice. Yeah, I love that Bruna quote. I've used it for many years myself. Yeah. And really exploring what it means yeah. okay we've got, we've got lots of questions but we've only got time for one more and so I think a particularly pertinent one is um, and I'll read it to you because it's something we've been talking about Liz from Jan how do we prevent Eero from following the Ofsted agenda Eero is currently obsessed with building learning outcomes into planning how can you do this in a child-led play program so maybe just a one or two thoughts about oh, right <laughs> from following um, the agenda and yeah the outcomes focus um so the work i've been doing on leadership with colleagues in australia um uh one of my colleagues says well we look to england not as an exemplar of good practice but you really are the canary in the mine and i have to say the canary is on life support um and possibly <laughs> gasping its last um how do you act how do we act back how do we speak back against very powerful discourses about effectiveness about outcomes about accountability because all of those things are important in one way so i would say again drawing on my research with schools formulate your own approaches be absolutely clear about the alignment between your own beliefs and your own approaches and Tifariki as uh, an open framework. Make sure that you can justify those approaches to anybody who comes into your setting, whether it's a family member um, um, or a member of, of ERO. My experience in England is that if you can speak to your practice in ways that are coherent, research-informed, 
and also ensuring that you are taking account of the statutory framework, then Ofsted are usually okay with that. But again, it demands a great deal of um, ability to articulate your professional knowledge, the values that underpin your practice, and to say, this is what we do, this is why we do it, this is how we do it. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. you. You've actually answered somebody else's question within that as well. So kia ora, Liz. Thank you so much for sharing your research and wisdom about play. I can't think of a better start to our seminar series for 2023 than these reminders about being vigilant about policy discourses, but also continuing to deepen our knowledge about play from um, some of these contemporary perspectives that you've shared in such an interesting and compelling way. So we do thank you very generously to, for offering this seminar to our attendees. I'm sure it will be viewed and revisited on our YouTube channel in the future. And I'd just like to finish with the following whakatauki for you. He taonga rongonui te aroha ki te tangata. Goodwill towards others is a precious treasure. So I'll hand back now to Justine to close the webinar. Thank you. Yada Helen, and thank you so much, Liz, for your presentation this evening. And I know, judging from the attendees that we've had and also the questions that um, we've had, that your presentation is going to act as a provocation for our audience to reflect on and engage in discussions about how play is positioned in philosophy, pedagogy, and practice in their early childhood settings, and to start critiquing also how policy is impacting on that in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So na mahi nui ki a koe Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. To our, early to our early childhood seminar series audience, if you wish to share or revisit this presentation, please check out our early childhood seminar series YouTube channel. The recording of this seminar will be available in a couple of days. And we look forward to seeing you all back for our next seminar in early March, when we will have Dr. Kane Meesel presenting findings from the Growing Up in New Zealand study. So keep an eye on your inbox for the flyer and registration information. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We'll close with a whakatauki. Manaki whenua, manaki tangata, haere whakamua. Care for the land, care for the people, go forward. Take good care, everyone. Kia kaha, kia ora, kia atawhai, ka kite anō.